webcasting around the world from the desert metropolis of Phoenix, Arizona, this is The Dividing Line. The Apostle Peter commanded Christians to be ready to give a defense for the hope that is within us, yet to give that answer with gentleness and reverence. Our host is Dr. James White, Director of Alpha Omega Ministries and an elder at the Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church. This is a live program, and we invite your participation. If you'd like to talk with Dr. White, call now at 602-973-4602 or toll free across the United States. It's 1-877-753-3341. And now with today's topic, here is James White. Hey, good morning. Welcome to the Dividing Line Tuesday morning. Going to continue with our review of the 1993 Soul Scriptura debate today. Just a quick note, those of you in the New Mexico area, one of the more heavily populated areas of the United States, <laughs> well, Santa Fe's got a few folks there, and uh, we will be in Santa Fe this weekend. I will be speaking uh, three, at least three times. I will be doing presentation on Sunday morning on the reliability of the New Testament. I spent all day yesterday, from morning till night, uh, on a brand new presentation on that, uh, using uh, the ever-advanced technology of the Mac. Uh, i got to admit, Keynote is a tremendous program, and uh, I had a lot of fun putting together a uh, presentation on the reliability of the text of the New Testament uh, that I'll be using for the very first time there in Santa Fe. And we'll also be speaking of Islam and the Marian dogmas. So I am currently updating those presentations uh, as well as what I was doing before I came in here. So that'll be this uh, Saturday. And then, of course, uh, please note, you in the Southern California area, I always get California people going, when are you coming back to California? Man, I'm over there all the time. Uh, I think they're going to start charging me taxes. Uh, I'm, I'm over there so often. But uh, we will be in the L.A. area. Uh, the following uh, Saturday, and then down in San Diego the following Sunday, three debates against uh, Farhan Kadeshi and Osama Abdullah are the two gentlemen that I'll be uh, debating. And we will be discussing the crucifixion and the reliability of the New Testament and the deity of Christ, all those key issues that you deal with when you deal with the subject of Islam. And so we would... Uh, Highly encourage you to be there. It's one thing to listen to those debates. It's something else to be there and get to hear, for example, some of the audience comments that do not make it onto the videotape. <laughs> so you, you definitely uh, will want to be there, especially my friends out at Westminster Seminary in Escondido. I hope some of you can uh, come out uh, as well for the Sunday afternoon encounter at that particular point in time. So that's what's uh, coming up. And then the week after that is the uh, Ligonier Conference here in Phoenix. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> this year is just flying by, isn't it? And then uh, only got to October, and uh, six days into November, I'm headed off for London. I'm very, very appreciative of those of you who have given sacrificially and specially to uh, make that uh, trip work. I continue to pray for that, and uh, we certainly could continue to use your support uh, for that effort. Um, need to get hold of the folks uh, in the television channel. Uh, they aren't responding to my emails, and I'm a little bit concerned, especially this time of year, people go on holiday in, uh, in England, and uh, we call them vacations, they call them holidays, and I'm a little concerned that the person whose email address I have is on holiday, and uh, so I just uh, sent an email to somebody else, could we try another way to get through here, because I want to have all this stuff uh, lined up, and I will be putting up, I know some of you have asked, uh, we, I think, didn't you get a call from London? Uh, someone asking, I want to know exactly where he's going to be and when and so on and so forth. I'll be trying to put that together as best I can. It's not always easy to do. Uh, and uh, some people know how well I did before the new uh, format of the website in keeping up uh, on the calendar page. And uh, so <laughs> it was more of a historical thing, but a bit of a joke. But anyhow, so we'll try to let you know about that. And, of course, uh, still need to let everybody know we're doing a cruise and a conference at the end of January. Uh, sometimes I think because it's in January, it just seems like it's forever away. Uh, because for us, there's this, like this, this wall between December and January. And then you get January and start thinking about the rest of the year. Well, it doesn't work that way. And... Um, I really encourage you to uh, be looking forward to the conference that we'll be having, the debate that I'll be having with Bart Ehrman. I honestly think that'll be one of the most important debates we've ever done. 
Uh, Bart Ehrman is uh, undoubtedly considered the leading critic of the New Testament, critic in a negative sense, uh, of the New Testament uh, today. Uh, his materials are utilized uh, by every community college philosophy professor out there to attempt to uh, uh, convert our young people uh, away from faith in Christ. And uh, so uh, the subject, the topic, uh, everything is exactly what we would want it to be, and so I'm very much looking forward to that debate. And so I would encourage you to be making plans to be there. Register for the conference. There will be some great speakers as well as the debate itself. And then, of course, uh, a wonderful time of fellowship on uh, the cruise uh, that follows thereafter. It's only a four-day, so it's not one of those big, huge things where you have to burn every bit of... Uh, 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 vacation that you uh, have ever built up and uh, so I would encourage you to look at the website and to join us uh, on that. It's also exceptionally uh, cost friendly. Uh, I dare you to look at our costs and compare them to pretty much anybody else and when you do you'll go, whoa, okay alright, that's, mm, yeah, alright uh, we do this as a really f as a perspective of ministry and uh, so I would encourage you to take a look at that. So with that having been said, before we, uh, st I start listening to Patrick Madrid again, I want to read a portion uh, from my response to Patrick Madrid's hit article called The White Man's Burden. And um, in essence, I'm addressing here some conversations that took place between myself and Carl Keating and Patrick Madrid after the debate. And in essence, I pointed out that... Uh, the definition that Patrick Madrid attempted to force me to defend is not the definition of Sola Scriptura, found in historical documents, in the Westminster Confession of Faith, in the London Baptist Confession of Faith. It, it is a straw man. And his response was fascinating. Uh, and I reproduced it in, uh, in the material. Notice what he says. Quote, Assume this is an accurate statement, that Pat used a definition different from yours. So what? He wasn't debating James White's definition. He was debating what he and I and many others consider to be the real world definition of Sola Scriptura as found among Bible Christians. Please note that the resolution of the debate didn't define Sola Scriptura. That was up to the debaters. If they wanted to use slightly different definitions, they had a right to do so. Whether or not your definition agree with Pat's, and I don't think they were far apart at all, the debate wasn't about fixing a definition. It was mainly about arguing whether particular verses supported Sola Scriptura. That argument can, can be carried out even if the debaters differ a bit on their definitions. By the way, Pat wasn't supposed to deal with your affirmative proposition, but with the affirmative proposition found in the resolution. That's what he did. Debate propositions are framed in the resolution itself, not in the first speaker's opening statement, to which I responded at the time, Try to imagine how Mr. Keating would respond if the roles were reversed. Let's say that I debated Mr. Keating on the Immaculate Conception, and by the way, I'd be more than happy to do so, but Mr. Keating doesn't debate anymore, and after his opening statements, decide to present my own definition of that doctrine. Or let's say we were debating papal infallibility, and I said to Mr. Keating, now, I believe this doctrine means that popes are supposed to be sinless, so how do you explain Alexander VI or uh, John XII? Would Mr. Keating feel it was okay for me to redefine his doctrines and then insist that he defend my redefinitions? Well, of course not. He would rightly protest that, to be fair, I must accurately and honestly portray the Roman doctrines as they are defined by Rome. Yet, seemingly, the men of Catholic Answers do not extend this treatment to others. Here, the president of Catholic Answers seemingly says, Hey, sure, Patrick gives a different definition, but so what? Who said he had to debate your definition? A fascinating admission, indeed. And so uh, I, I do find that quite interesting and uh, quite representative of the fact that, in essence, uh, Catholic Answers uh, feel they can determine uh, what our doctrines are, use their definitions, and even when we say, that's a straw man, well, it doesn't matter. We can, I've, I've met people that believe that. Well, I've met Roman Catholics that believe almost anything. I've met Roman Catholics who present all sorts of things. That the men of Catholic answers will say, oh no 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 no, that's that's not Catholic. No 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 no. Uh, yeah okay. I see a little bit of a double standard here, and um, and most well, indeed. All right, let's go back and pick up right where we left off on uh, the subject of Sola Scriptura. Patrick Madrid is just beginning his opening statement. Yes. So my task is to demonstrate that Sola Scriptura is unbiblical. 
I don't have to prove the case for tradition. Mr. White claims that I must be able to prove every point from Scripture alone. So sola scriptura itself must be proved from Scripture alone. Now, once again, I just want to mention, um, I have many times challenged uh, these individuals to positively defend their claims to ultimate authority. That's not what they like to do. Like, they like to attack sola scriptura. That's, that's their thing. And they don't want to have to apply the same standards to their own claims that they apply to the claims of others. But if you are going to use, if you're going to assume the correctness of the Roman Catholic concept of tradition as part of your argument against sola scriptura, then I insist that you do need to prove it. Uh, if you're not going to prove it, if you are going to just let it, you know, uh, you know, stand on its on its own assertion, but use it as a part of your argument, which I assert is exactly what they do, then you do have to defend it. Uh, but that's exactly what they don't want to do. And if it can't be done, Sola Scriptura is a self-refuting proposition, and therefore it is false. Tonight's debate is about truth, the truth Jesus wants for you and for me to stand firm and hold fast to. But what is the truth about Sola Scriptura? Does the Bible really teach it? Did the apostles teach it? Did Jesus teach it? Many approach scripture with the predetermined conviction that the Catholic Church must be wrong. So they search to find verses which they can cobble together in an attempt to refute a given Catholic teaching. Their hostility to the Catholic Church often makes it very difficult for them to view the Catholic case objectively. I would ask you, please, can I put aside any predetermined ideas you may have about Sola Scriptura, pro or con? Let the Lord speak to you tonight through Scripture. You will see, I believe, that the Bible does not teach Sola Scriptura. The Apostles did not teach Sola Scriptura. Jesus did not teach, teach Sola Scriptura. And I believe that if you want to be faithful to the teachings of Jesus, you must reject Sola Scriptura as a tradition of men. If you don't reject it, God will hold you accountable. Protestant apologists commonly make several mistakes in their zeal to vindicate Sola Scriptura. My opponent tonight may not make all of these mistakes, but you need to know about them so that you can know how to handle them when you encounter them. Mistake number one. If you have your notepads out, I'd ask you to write these down. Mistake number one. Confusing formal and material sufficiency. This is a crucial point in tonight's debate. Now, by the way, this, I believe... Uh, was the first time that Mr. Madrid ever raised this distinction. In fact, I, I haven't taken the time to do it, but I, I scanned through it once, and I, I'd be happy to be shown uh, my error, but I do not believe that this distinction appears in Carl Keating's book, at least as it existed in 1993. It may have been added at a point after that. Uh, but this was uh, the first time that they uh, attempted to use this kind of discussion Unfortunately, they do so seemingly without recognizing the uh, evolutionary nature of the Roman Catholic position in regards to this issue. And since it doesn't get a whole lot of definition during the debate, let me mention it to you now. And that is, uh, you have those who say that the scriptures are materially sufficient but not formally sufficient. They're materially sufficient in that all the divine revelation is at least implicitly found in the written scriptures. Now, realize that for Rome, implicitly means that you can look at Revelation 12 and the woman, and that's Mary. And you can look at Luke 128 and build a colossus of theology out of an angelic greeting. So, saying something is implicitly found in scripture from the Roman Catholic perspective basically means that there are enough words in scripture that we can crowbar anything into what the Bible says. All right, and anybody could use that. The Mormon could say, "Oh, I believe it's materially sufficient." You know, uh, uh, yeah, we don't have uh, clear statements of the exaltation of Godhood, but you look over here what Jesus said to your gods. Just like you know, you can anybody can can make the implicit claim uh, where, you know, well, okay, the grammar doesn't say it, and the syntax doesn't mean, it, and then in the original context that wouldn't necessarily. But you see, the church's tradition allows us to see this. Blah 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 blah. blah. That was not the perspective of the majority of people at the Council of Trent. The majority of the people at the Council of Trent, when they first wrote their first definition uh, of the issue of the relationship of Scripture and tradition, used phraseology called partum partum, Latin for partly and partly. That is, God's revelation is given partly 
in the written tradition, scripture, and partly in the oral tradition. Now, anybody who adopts the material sufficiency thing, the material sufficiency position, you should not hear them quoting 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. Why? Because 2 Thessalonians 2, 15, which speaks of the traditions which were passed on to us, whether by word of mouth or by letter, shouldn't be relevant to them because everything that's in the written is what's revelation, at least implicitly. But you see, everybody knows that everything that Rome has defined solely on the basis of tradition is not actually found in Scripture. You cannot find papal infallibility in Scripture. Just listen to these people try to come up with a, a means of defending papal infallibility from Scripture. It is uh, ridiculous. It's so easy to demonstrate that they are grossly misusing the text that it's ridiculous. Uh, the Marian dogmas, again, you know, going off to Solomon's, Solomon and his mother and trying to build some type of queenly coronation silliness out of this. Uh, I, I love when they do that kind of stuff because only the most starry-eyed Romanist is sitting there going, wow, that's great. And everybody else who has, a, has any sense whatsoever of reading something in context, the his, historical context of Scripture, blah, 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 blah. Uh, they, they're sitting there going, you're, you're seriously suggesting this is a meaningful use of the text? Uh, so I love when they go that direction. It's, it, it's, it's amazing um, as to how that works. So anyway, what you'll hear is you'll hear them, and, and this is what Madrid's going to do in this debate. He's going to talk about, oh, material sufficiency, material sufficiency. So he does not have to defend the idea that in the oral tradition you find Paul actually teaching the stuff Rome teaches. Because that's what 2 Thessalonians 2.15 would mean. If you're going to cite that passage, then what it means is that Paul had already delivered to the Thessalonians in his first epistle and in his preaching all these doctrines and dogmas. So he had already taught the Thessalonians about papal infallibility, even though there wasn't a pope yet. And he had already taught them about the Marian dogmas, even though history is silent, has absolutely no evidence whatsoever that anybody back then believed what Rome teaches today as dogma about Mary. And so they don't want to have to defend that because they can't. It's not possible. It's impossible. But they still need to find a way of defending themselves. So what they do is they'll, they'll, they'll assert material sufficiency, but then they'll quote these texts about tradition in their attacks on Sola Scriptura, and when you start to refute them, then they back off to the material sufficiency. Well, I, I don't... I, I believe in material sufficiency. You're just confusing people. I believe in material sufficiency. Then why are you quoting 2 Thessalonians 2? Why are you talking about this tradition? Well, it's just an interpretive tradition. Oh, so what you're telling us is that what Paul taught the Thessalonians to do was to interpret Scripture, not all of which actually had been written yet, in such a way that they would see in Luke 128 all the Marian dogmas, and they would understand papal infallibility through the interpretive methodology delivered to the Thessalonians. Is that what you're saying? And they don't want to go there. Uh, their people don't, don't force them to go there. Uh, only we do. And so they, they don't want to go there. So they'll take two different positions. And at one point they'll, they'll, they'll push the part and part of idea, but then as soon as you challenge them to demonstrate, hey, show me that what you have in, in those oral traditions substantiates the dogmas that you have defined on the basis that, oh, 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 no, 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 we don't have to do that because I believe in material sufficiency, see. And so you'll hear him do this back and forth, back and forth, a number of times, uh, use one argument, and then back off to a, a position that, that doesn't make as much of a claim, but then go back out to it later on and say, oh, you're just misunderstanding me. You're, you don't understand what's going on here, etc. So you're making errors. Uh, that's exactly how uh, Roman Catholic controversialists are functioning in our, our modern context. It may surprise you to learn that the Catholic position allows for what we call the material deficiency of Scripture. This means that Scripture contains everything necessary for Christian teaching. Now, did you notice he said, allows for. Later on, he's going to say something else. He's going to say, the Catholic position is, and it isn't. Where has Rome dogmatically defined material sufficiency as the dogmatic position of the Church? Uh, it's, it's just, uh, you know, uh, all you got to do, I would love to see, I personally think, Carl Keating and Patrick Madrid and Jimmy Aiken, uh, absolutely have a moral responsibility to debate cherry matitics. I 
really do. I I think they put him out there. They put his pictures in this rock. They're the ones that gave this guy his start. And I think they've got a more responsibility to debate that guy. I would love to listen to them crossing Roman swords, uh, swinging at each other with, with swords all forged out of the dogmatic documents of the Roman Catholic Church. And that's exactly why they won't do it, because they know that would be the greatest refutation of their own arguments that's ever been put on video. And they know it. And that's why they stay away from him assiduously. Uh, <laughs> I would love to see that happen. I really, really would, but it ain't going to be happening anytime soon. All doctrines can be found there implicitly or explicitly, but they're all there. Formal sufficiency, on the other hand, is the position that Mr. White is attempting to prove. Formal sufficiency means that Scripture contains all necessary Christian truth and, and it's a very important and, that Scripture's meaning is so clear that the church and tradition are not necessary to arrive at an accurate interpretation of the meaning of Scripture. Uh, that's not true. Uh, let's, let's try to correct that. Uh, what he's going to try to do later on is he is going to go directly against the actual statements of the um, uh, Westminster Confession of Faith that, demon that specifically says, not all portions of Scripture are alike clear. And he's going to try to do the divide and conquer thing. Uh, this, this review is going to be very, really helpful in going through all the different errors that Roman Catholics make in trying to attack Sola Scriptura. I, I really think it, that it will be. He's going to go through all that stuff. The idea of material sufficiency is that the scriptures are meant to function as the sole infallible rule of faith of the church without the addition of any kind of likewise infallible teaching authority that they contain within themselves the ability upon due application upon due application of effort of study to function as the sole infallible rule of faith of the church it is not and this is you're going to hear him do this it's cheap shot he's wrong demonstrates he can't win this argument against the actual doctrine of souls from Tura. But he's going to later on say, look, the fact there's all these different perspectives, the fact that the, plan the surface meaning of the text is not enough. No one's saying the surface meaning of the text is enough. No one is saying that someone who's completely ignorant of the Bible, completely ignorant of the people of Israel, can just pick the thing up and read a few pages and go, oh, I've got the whole thing. No one is saying that. But that's what they want us to try to defend is that, well, that this is exactly what we are saying. It is not, uh, and this goes back to what I read to you at the beginning. Hey, we don't need to use your definition. We don't need to go after what you actually are saying. Um, uh, that's, that's where, uh, again, uh, when I debate the Marian dogmas, what source do I use to define them? Rome's infallible dogmatic definitions. Why can't Patrick Madrid and Carl Keating and these guys do the same thing in reverse? Well, they just can't. In the course of this debate, Mr. White may make the mistake of assuming that the Catholic Church rejects the material sufficiency of Scripture. It doesn't. What it does reject is the error of the formal sufficiency of Scripture. As a Catholic, I contend that all Christian doctrines are at least implicitly present in Scripture. But that doesn't mean Scripture is always sufficiently clear so that every Christian doctrine is explicitly and conclusively evident. For example, the Bible does not say that Christians should baptize infants, nor does it say that only adults must be baptized. It's now, notice what he's doing. We're in an Orthodox Presbyterian church, and he is beginning to divide and conquer. And you know they sat down in the offices of Catholic Answers and said, oh, let's do this, let's do this. You know what the difference is, and this has come up a number of times, you know the difference between Roman Catholics and Protestants at this point is that I can get together, and I did in 1995, about uh, right at two years after this, had the first debate we had on this subject. Uh, one of the people I was debating, uh, Dr. Robert Strimble, uh, very well-known uh, Presbyterian uh, professor and scholar. And most of you know that I debated uh, Bill Shishko on this subject a couple of years ago, right around this time, uh, two years ago now. And that was followed with a, by a Skype debate with uh, Greg Strawbridge. 
every single one of them, by the way, just to mention it again in passing, every single one of them, I was responding to the challenge to debate those issues. I did not issue those challenges to debate. And what did each one of them demonstrate? That we, as brothers in Christ, who share the same gospel, who share a commitment to sola scriptura, can go to the inspired text of scripture to debate that very issue. We don't have to go to the code of canon law. And we don't have to go to this council and to that council because the fact of the matter is, folks, you can't go to those councils because they don't speak with one voice on so many issues. They don't clarify, they confuse. They don't clarify the biblical text in any way, shape, or form. And so we can confess that we together as brothers can go to the biblical text to address these issues. That's where the difference lies. And that's where we have demonstrated the consistency of our position in approaching it in exactly that way. He doesn't tell us. Paul and the other writers of the New Testament assumed their readers already knew the answer to this question from observing the practice of the church. So they didn't see the need to address this issue explicitly. Some people, such as Lutherans, Methodists, and Presbyterians, say the biblical evidence that, baptize, that babies were baptized in the New Testament is good, so therefore we should baptize babies. Others, such as Baptists, Pentecostals, and Jehovah's Witnesses, say the biblical evidence shows that babies were not and should not be baptized. Scholars on both sides of the debate admit that the biblical evidence is simply inconclusive. But if the evidence is inconclusive on this or any other doctrine, then scripture is manifestly not sufficient to give us a conclusive interpretation of everything that it teaches. In fact, scripture itself denies that its doctrines are always clear to all readers. In 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16, we... Now, here is one of the key texts. Now, listen and see if Mr. Madrid will give you a meaningful exegesis of this text or whether he will simply use it and then avoid its actual meaning. Our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable people distort as they do other scriptures to their own destruction. So we see here that the Bible warns us that its doctrines can be misunderstood, they can be unclear, and it can be distorted. Now, um, can Roman Catholic doctrines be unclear, misunderstood, and distorted? Of course, anything can be. Anything can be. The most simple truths are all liable to distortion by those who desire to distort truth. Big deal. But does the text teach what Roman Catholic controversialists would have us to teach? have us to believe it teaches? No, of course it doesn't. Notice what it says. Notice he, he says in his letter there are some things. If it's some things, that means that there are other things that are what? Patently clear and obvious. Right? And then it says that certain untaught and unstable individuals distort their own destruction. If there are untaught and unstable individuals, what does that mean? That means that there are taught and stable individuals who do not distort God's truth to their own destruction. Instead, they handle the word of God aright to the benefit of the people of God. And so, it amazes me. It shouldn't, because Roman Catholics don't do exegesis. I mean, let's, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. Uh, Roman Catholic apologists don't do exegesis. That's not their forte. They're, they need to be exegeting a whole big body of stuff called the dogmatic teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and they, they, you know, you got to feel sorry for these folks. They're conservatives in a very liberal modern Roman Catholic Church. they they got to be trying to make Rome look like something that really isn't anymore. Uh, they know that the majority of their bishops and their cardinals and their prelates are way to their left in their theological perspectives. It must be a really weird thing to be trying to defend a church like that. But, hey, you know, that's their... Uh, their road to uh, to hoe, in essence. Their row to hoe. I know what row to hoe means. <laughs> anyway, uh, but they're not doing exegesis, and they're not going to look at this text. And now, I, I realize that 
by quoting this, I'm actually saying that there are certain taught and stable men um, who um, uh, can handle the word of God aright, and that there are things in Scripture that are, are self-evidently clear, um, but uh, instead they want to turn around and say, See? Be afraid of Scripture. It can be misused. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, that's, again, why they won't debate gerrymatics, because uh, they'll, then you can turn around and say, uh, From your perspective, isn't Jerry doing exactly what you say your magisterium keeps from happening? I mean, if you have this happening in your own fellowship, in your own communion, he's using the same sources you say are sufficient to answer all these questions. Hmm, sounds like your argument's somewhat self-refuting, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that's exactly. Well, speaking of Jerry Manitix, just in passing, how'd you like that segue, Rich? Is it pretty good? Uh, we have a, a new debate format available to you. And a couple of you have found out about it, <laughs> but we need to put a big advertising banner up. We are starting to make the move into making our stuff available in downloadable form and video format. Uh, obviously, the fact that I do so much on YouTube, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we've got over 720,000 video views now on the YouTube account. Uh, coming up on a million. Uh, it's pretty pretty good, pretty great. Um, the fact that we're doing all that stuff starts making you go, well, you know, it sure would be nice to be able to uh, put this debate um, on, on, my, on my iPod because that's how people watch a lot of stuff anymore. Watch on the computer, watch on the iPod. Well, uh, we have the first one done, and uh, it is the Marion doc uh, Dogmas debate. I think that was one of the best debates. It was the very first one on Long Island, and uh, I, I thought it, was, it went very, very well. And um, uh, so it's available. I think it's number 574 on uh, 572 on the website. And um, you download that baby and stick her in iTunes, and uh, there you go. You can. It looks really, really sharp and nice. And it's playable under QuickTime, and also uh, you can import it into iTunes and put it on your iPod, and the video on iPod looks fantastic. Yes, it does. Yeah, uh, it, it really does. Um, I won't mention the specific program, but a couple of years ago I was following a particular weekly program, and I was traveling, so I couldn't see it. And so it was really cool to be able to download that and watch it on my iPod. And i got to admit, it's not difficult to uh, to follow along, you know. It's even that tiny little screen, uh, the resolution's quite high. So, speaking of Jerry Matitix, back when Jerry Matitix was still considered Orthodox Roman Catholic, uh, and he, of course, was still considering himself that, uh, just, hey, that's an argument for their side to take care of. Uh, we'll, we'll let them do that kind of thing. But uh, that is uh, available on the website now, so uh, you might want to be looking for that. And, of course, we are going to be continuing to offer more and more of that material, uh, putting the great debates and uh, the others that we're doing on uh, that format and making them available to you. So uh, avail yourself of the opportunities. Okay, so we come back to, we don't have this one on video, unfortunately. Uh, it wasn't videotaped, but uh, it would have been interesting. So, hey, you know, maybe Patrick would like to do it again. Since he's 2-0, oh, uh, maybe we could do it again and put it on video this time, and then he could make it available to people on iPod. Because if he's 2-0, oh, I mean, he's going to win again, right? Uh, there's no way that I can win a debate on Sola Scriptura. Well, well, wait a minute. Actually, Patrick told me that I beat Jerry Manitix in a debate on Sola Scriptura. Isn't, isn't that odd? But anyway, we continue on. State number two, using a hermeneutic of anachronism. Protestant apologists read back into Scripture in the writings of the Church Fathers the particular doctrines they wish to find, and they ignore or explain away what they don't wish to see. <laughs> that is one of the best descriptions I've ever heard of exactly what Roman Catholicism does to the Church Fathers. My goodness, how many times have we demonstrated the anachronistic reading of early Church Fathers by Roman Catholic controversialists? I mean, it's constant. It's all the time. And they have to do it, because their ultimate authority says... This has been the constant teaching of the church. We are infallible. Therefore, if you put those glasses on and start reading the early church fathers, uh, what are you going to find? Uh, you're going to find that kind of stuff all through the text. And what are you going to do? Listen, it'll be the... Which one will it be? It'll be... Actually, it should be the next one uh, that Rich will be digitizing and making available is my debate on Sola Scriptura with Jerry Manitix. And... Every time that I throw out something 
that is from an early church father that disagreed with his position. Well, that's just his personal opinion, uh, Mr. White. That's just his person. That was just to him speaking as a private theologian. Uh, the, the magical circularity of, of Romanism is so amazing to watch. You know, we were, we were, we were having a conversation with a, a Catholic convert in Channel recently, and we were talking about uh, papal infallibility. And we brought up the issue of Honorius again. And it, if you want to see circularity, if you want to see how tightly a, a person can spin in a circle, then get a Roman Catholic talking about papal infallibility. Because what they'll do is say, well, the po everything the Pope says isn't infallible. Well, that, that's true. Okay, so how do you know what is infallible and what is not infallible? And the only way they can do it is by looking back over succeeding generations. Because we point out, look, in the days when Honorius writes his letter, and in the centuries after Honorius, where Honorius himself is anathematized by a general council, and every bishop of Rome that takes the chair of Peter anathematizes Honorius in taking the chair of Peter. In all those centuries, where they hadn't developed this idea of papal infallibility yet, where they hadn't come up with these wonderful definitions that makes everything go away, how could you have known at that time? How could you have known in the days of Honorius that what Honorius was writing as the Bishop of Rome was not, in fact, infallible truth? And they have no way of answering that. They can't answer that. It's not possible. And so the, the definition is just so wonderful in that it's, it's, you can't disprove it. It's impossible to disprove it. It, it, is, it is not subject to being disproven. Because basically it boils down to this. The Pope's infallible. And when he makes a mistake, he wasn't speaking infallibly. <laughs> That's great. I love it. What a, what a wonderful definition. And you can, you can bring that out and show that to people and, see, and show them, did you realize that what you're saying is the Pope's infallible except when he's not? Do you realize that's what you're saying? And they'll just sit there and go, oh, and isn't it wonderful? <laughs> isn't it, I just love the liturgy. It's so beautiful. And you're, you're like, Wow. You, you don't see that? Oh, yeah, just the, the blinds go down. It's like, mm, that, nope, didn't notice that one. Uh, so it, 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 it is amazing. The Mormons do this in their attempt to prove, so-called, that the Bible and the early church believed in many gods. Since the time the devil used scripture to tempt Jesus in the desert, doctrinal error has always been advanced under the guise of Bible verses. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 15, Beware of false prophets who will come to you in sheep's clothing but underneath, they are ravenous wolves. Error comes packaged under the wrapping paper of Bible verses. Yeah, including Ev <laughs> including Patrick Madrid's uh, attempts to defend the papacy and the Marian dogmas. And uh, yeah, uh, no one's going to disagree with that. But does that mean that those Bible verses are being rightly used? That they are being rightly exegeted? Well, of course not. Marians did it. The Albigensians did it. The Mormons do it. And I'm afraid tonight Mr. White is doing it. Mistake number three, thinking that the phrase word of God applies... Now, by the way, I cannot tell you how many Roman Catholics have expressed such anger and have accused me of being mean-spirited and nasty and heartless and harsh whenever I have even for a moment made a connection in methodology between Roman Catholicism and anybody, especially Mormonism. Oh, you're so nasty, you're so hate-filled, and yet didn't Sir Patrick Madrid just link me to Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and so on and so forth? I think he just did, uh, but I never hear anybody complaining about that for some reason. Mm, sounds like a double standard. Scripture alone. Scripture does refer to itself as God's Word, but many other things are called God's Word as well. For example, we see that Jesus is called the Word of God in flesh in John 1, verses 1 through 14. The Bible speaks of God's sovereign blessings that he speaks on his people as his Word in Isaiah 55, verses 10 through 11. And the Bible calls the oral proclamation of the Gospel the Word of God, such as in 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, where Paul says, And for this reason we too give thanks to God unceasingly that in receiving the Word of God from hearing us, you have received not a human word, but as it truly is, the Word of God. Now again, uh, I, I think uh, one of the problems that Catholic Answers had, at least initially, and I don't think they've outgrown it, is that Carl Keating started it 
And the kind of people that Keating was trying to respond to uh, could be very, um, and I, I want to use this term carefully, but very fundamentalist in their perspective in the sense that uh, a lot of people that respond, you know, like the Alamos or something. I mean, uh, Jack Chick, okay? We're not talking about people who, you know, do a whole lot of study in church history. You know, I remember when I, I, I sent uh, the debate tapes from the third debate that I did, which was with Jerry Matitix on the papacy out in Tempe, Arizona in December of 1990. Right, yeah, December of 90. And I sent those uh, cassette tapes, yes, cassette tapes. Um, we need to define that for the younger people in the audience, sadly. Uh, I sent those cassette tapes to Dave Hunt. This was back before Dave Hunt had gone off on his anti-Calvinism harangues. And Dave scribbled me a note back that basically said, I, I don't worry about all that church history stuff. I just go with the Bible. Now, it's not quite true. Uh, he, he did eventually try to do church history stuff. Um, not very well, but he tried. And that's one of the really bad things is I recently was watching portions. I haven't listened to the whole thing yet, but I was watching portions as I was recording it of his debate with Shabir Ali and <laughs> uh, hmm, nah, uh, hmm, <laughs> this is as bad as I expected it to be. But anyway, uh, that's kind of attitude. Ah, don't worry about church history. Don't worry about that kind of thing. Um, Reformed apologists uh, do not argue the way that a King James-only fundamentalist would. Um, we do understand history, and we do understand the role of history and the importance of history, and and we understand what tradition is. We recognize that we have traditions. And we recognize the necessity of subjugating those traditions to the higher authority of that which is theonist us in Scripture. Uh, so we present a, a completely different perspective, in essence, than they do. And uh, yet they just don't seem to be able to grow past uh, that fundamentalism uh, response and, and stage. And so when they talk about, well, look... 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 uh, says that you uh, th that the word of God was spoken to them. Yeah, okay. No problem with that whatsoever. Uh, don't have any issues with that. Well, then where is that now? See, that's, that's the implicit assertion is that, you see, the, the oral word was spoken. Now, if they believe in material sufficiency, it shouldn't be overly relevant, should it be? This is where the pardon pardon stuff comes in. But even at that, this is why I asked, and, and I said a couple weeks ago, I hope I have improved in my understanding both the Roman Catholic position and Sola Scriptura since 1993. What I should have asked Patrick at some point, and it was a fairly short debate, so there wasn't a whole lot of time, but I, I should have asked the same question of Patrick that I did six years later when I debated Mr. Paqua in San Diego again on this subject. And I asked Mitch Paqua an honest question that I think is very important for people to hear. I asked them, I asked him this question. Can you name a single word, phrase, sentence, spoken by Jesus Christ or by any of the apostles that has been dogmatically defined by the Roman Catholic Church that is not found in Scripture? Because, see, I've listened to these Catholic converts. They write their conversion stories and the surprise by truth thing, and they all say the same thing. Oh, my eyes were opened when I realized Sola Scriptura was wrong because the Word of God was orally preached, and so there must be more. And I just want to go, um, excuse me, but um, what one word of Paul? Just, just one word. One syllable that Paul ever spoke has Rome ever dogmatically defined that does not exist in Scripture. What did he say that Rome's tradition gives you that Scripture does not dogmatically? Where is it? A word of Jesus. A word of the apostles. And there's silence. Because Mitch Paqua was very honest. He sat there and said, well, no, there's nothing. 
We, we've never, no, mm -mm, on this. Nope. And yet people write entire tomes based upon the assumption that, oh, I'm just so glad to have access to all this stuff I didn't have before. Um, what do you mean you didn't have before? You had scripture. And Rome isn't giving you anything. All she's giving you is her perversions of scripture. I mean, that's a strong word, but hey, look at look at indulgences and go read Hebrews, okay? Uh, that's that's a good good example. So remember, when you see tonight or hear tonight the phrase word of God, it doesn't always mean the Bible. We have to be careful. Oh, by the way, you know why he's doing this? Uh, I always found this to be interesting, and I know you have to do it up to a certain point, but uh, he's debating my presentation from 1990 in August of 1990 against Jerry Matitix, which, by the way, does exist on video. I would love to see it, but no one ever has. It, again, is held by Scott Butler. And Scott Butler got into an argument with Catholic Answers, and no one ended up with the videotape of that debate. I'd love to see it. It would have at least historical interest and value now. I have to wonder if the tapes even still exist. But uh, that initial debate... August 1990, we don't have it. Um, we, we wish we did, but we, we don't have it. And the two debates with Mitch Pacwa in uh, January of 1991, San Diego, tapes exist, professionally recorded, never made available. Uh, Scott Butler has them. At least I think he has. Yeah, most definitely, Scott Butler has them. And I've called upon Scott Butler many times. Do the right thing, Scott. We have how many debates? We ought to sit down sometime and figure out how many debates Alpha and Omega Ministries has done where we have handed to the Roman Catholic debater at the end of the night or shipped within a few weeks, depending on whether we did it there that evening or, or whether we, the videotapes to distribute as they pleased of that debate for absolutely, positively nothing. In fact, many of them got honorariums for being there that night anyways. So they got paid to be there to do, to do the debate, and they got the video for nothing. We paid the shipping. Scott Butler, do the right thing. Anybody who knows Scott Butler, contact him. Say, Scott, do the right thing. Send master copies of the initial debate with Jerry Matitix on Sola Scriptura and the two debates with Mitch Paco in San Diego to Alpha Omega Ministries and give them full rights of distribution. Do the right thing. If you don't, you're admitting they lost all those debates. That, that's what you're admitting that they lost it a bit. And Scott Butler admitted that to me. So he said that to me in private conversation, that, well, you know, uh, Father Pacwa isn't as good a debater as, you know, Scott Hahn. Well, we can't get Scott Hahn to debate anyways. So do the right thing, Mr. Butler, and let, let the videotapes go. <laughs> free the tapes. Free the tapes. We should show up outside of his office with, you know, signs, free the tapes. Uh, let, let people see. I'm able to search for the context of this verse. In the meaning, or the meaning of this verse in context. Now, Mr. White will only beg the question if he tries to use verses such as Psalm 119.89, where the psalmist says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in the heavens. This verse and the other verses like it, which, uh, which describe the attributes of, of the word of God, don't prove the formal sufficiency of Scripture. All they prove is that there is a certain attribute that the word of God has. And again, we have to know whether it's the written word of God, or the oral word of God, or the word of God in flesh, the Bible uses it in various ways. Mistake number four, confusing testimony with authority. Some Protestants argue that if the Catholic Church were the official witness to God's word, it would be over God's word. This is false. Just because one person serves as, one, as a witness to another person doesn't mean that he has an authority over that person. Now, uh, here we, we, we enter into a, a particular area of, real, of a real problem. Uh, in regards to his position. And that is the very issue that the caller brought up. Remember what started all this was I played a call where someone called in, asked Patrick Madrid about this debate. He promoted as, you know, this great be all and end all of all things, demonstrating the soul scripture isn't true. And now we're demonstrating that what it is, the straw man attack on soul scripture. Um, and one of the questions that the caller had was, what about ultimate authorities? What about ultimate authorities? He didn't really answer that question. And I have said many times, and I repeat it right now, and this will be my closing statement on this because we're going to take a phone call on another subject, but I repeat it right now. There is no way for a Roman Catholic to defend the idea that they are simply presenting the authority of the church as a witness to Scripture. Rome gets to define what is and what is not Scripture. He's going to use the canon argument later on. He's going to wait for the second rebuttal period to do it, but he's going to use the canon argument later on. That means he's saying Rome defines the canon. 
then Rome defines the infallible teaching of Scripture. So what Scripture is and what Scripture says is determined by whom? Rome. When it comes to the idea of tradition, who defines what is and what is not tradition? Rome. When it comes to the issue of what tradition teaches or means, who defines it? Rome. Don't tell me Rome is under the authority of anything or is equal in authority with anything else when you cannot define what scripture is and what it means outside of, the tr outside of Rome's authority, when you can't define what tradition is or what it means outside of Rome's authority, folks, that's sola ecclesia. They don't like us pointing that out, but that's the way it is. And if you can demonstrate how that's different, if you can demonstrate that's not the case, now there are, there are less conservative Roman Catholics who aren't Catholic apologists, who will who will argue like a Madrid does, or who won't argue like an like uh, like Jerry Manitix used to argue, or something like that, and they'll they'll say, well, you know, uh, we, we don't make quite that stride of uh, 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 assertion. Yes, you do. Uh, if and when when they come out and start saying the Patrick Madrids and Tim Staples of the worlds are all washed up, they're all wrong. That's what we're talking about. Okay, fine. Until they're willing to do that, then that's the situation we're facing. Now we're going to uh, step aside of that for just a moment. And uh, uh, take phone call uh, from uh, Cape uh, Coral, Florida. Let's talk with uh, Mike. Hi, Mike. Hey, Dr. White. How are you today? How you doing? I understand. Uh, let me uh, let me bring the audience up to speed here real quick. Um, I don't even know how long ago it was. Uh, what was it? About a month, month and a half, two months ago? Yeah. I, I don't remember what it was. I I put up a, a, a very brief blog post uh, because I think someone in channel or somebody sent me an email. I forget how it was, but I I ran across uh, Joel Hemphill's um, book or an advertisement for his book um, that basically presents an Arian uh, denial of the deity of Christ. Now. Joel Hemphill has pretty much a oneness type background, so that's a rather interesting transition from uh, Jesus only to the Father only, but uh, that's even terminology that I understand even he's utilized. And so I, I just mentioned this and mentioned once again the irony of the fact that someone who is anti-Trinitarian uh, would be singing in Baptist churches and, and, uh, and things like that, just as an illustration of something I've pointed out with Phillips Craig and Dean and others, that there just doesn't seem to be any theological discernment uh, when it comes to uh, this, uh, this issue of worship and theology in the church and, and things like that. So, um, last week, we got a phone call here at the office from Joel Hemphill, and he and Rich went round and round, and my understanding is you've had a few conversations, too, and you're calling in to sort of fill us in on, on what those conversations were about. That, that is true. To segue into that, uh, what happened was, uh, Dr. White, several months ago, my mother actually had received his, well, <clears throat> his scholarly pamphlet. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking Admissions uh, Facing the Truth Regarding the Doctrine of the Trinity by uh, the prophet Joel Hemphill. The prophet? And the reason why I say that, I'll qualify this very carefully, is because last night in my discussion with him, he did not at all, uh, he did not at all uh, accept the position of being called a prophet. Because I had mentioned this to him. I said, well, you're acting in a prophetical role in the terms of a prophet. You say God spoke to you back in 1986 to basically straighten out this whole matter. So you as a prophet are telling us basically the whole kit and caboodle as to why the Trinity doctrine is wrong. And he didn't, and he never denied uh, the issue of being called a prophet. Hmm. And I even said, hey, look, I'm going to call the program tomorrow. James has already invited you to do it. I encourage you to do it. He said he wouldn't do it. He said he would rather have you call him. <laughs> <laughs> but I say, look, if, if I stand on the radio tomorrow that you take issue with, please call in and set me right. I have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. So I'm calling in. I wanted to be made, uh, to make it known that I talked to him last night. Uh, very round robin. Uh, basically, he got into his preaching mode for a while. So I sat there patiently to listen to him, and he was highly offended with Rich. <laughs> <laughs> Because of their uh, their discussion, and obviously he did take use to you with uh, some of your comments regarding his his stance on uh, Arianism, and of course uh, agreeing with Muslims as to their version of Christ, and uh, you know basically went to the he went to the point to where hey look I, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness I'm not a Muslim I don't know why James has said that I don't know why you're saying it well we're not saying it and James had never accused you of that he's saying regarding some uh, some of your comments. 
they line up with their thinking. Right. That doesn't make you them in terms of your overall theology. Uh, that, that, just re- that just requires very fundamental ability to think in categories properly, and it doesn't sound like, uh, like he's exercising that fundamental uh, capacity. I know in his conversation with Rich, Rich kept asking him, what did James say that was wrong? Well, uh, he said he likened me to Muslims, and, I, and, and it, over and over again, the same type of category errors, rather than actually dealing with uh, the fact that in reality he is saying he is denying the deity of Christ, and in so doing, that's the only issue. That's the only thing to really address. Now, just it's interesting something you just said. Let me see if I can address this. We only got a couple minutes, but does does he say that he? he received revelation on yes. this subject? Yes, that's correct, that God personally spoke to him about this. So this is the 28th book of the New Testament, now called uh, Hempelians? Well, you know, hey, you mentioned uh, our Roman Catholic friends uh, just moments ago dealing with how Rome gets to define what is and yeah. what is not scripture. Well, I think we have some of an, an applicable situation here with Joel. Yeah, yeah. In, many, in some regard, you know what I'm saying? So... <laughs> you know, as you would say, do the right thing, and hey, Joel, you know, I even asked him, you know, because he, he was very, very clear, hey, look, I have converted thousands over my position. Thousands? Thousands. I, oh. said, okay, name, mm. I said, name five. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do it. Would not push no, it. I no, need, no. I don't need to do that. Yeah. I said, well, Joel, look, if you're a prophet, and you want to straighten out this entire matter, and you're loving enough, okay, why can't you simply suggest, hey, look, call so-and-so, I converted him from this position, he can fill you in. You're not even willing to do that. Mm. To me, that's very suspicious. And so he said in turn, he said, are you calling me a liar? I said, well, you are a liar. You are. And he wanted basically to end the conversation at that point. Mm. Well, yeah, I know, so I Go ahead. well, another thing that Rich really challenged him on was, what are you doing singing in Trinitarian churches? I uh, that exactly. And, and right. taking their money and... Um, uh, you know, it, it would be one thing, you, you know, I would speak at a, um, at a oneness church as long as I was debating and defending the Trinity, uh, and I was defending justification by faith or something like that. I've told, I've told uh, 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 the heads of, of the UPCI that I'll, I'll go to their school and uh, debate right in front of their students. That's, that's no problem. But I'm not going to go there and pretend to, quote, unquote, lead them in worship. Right. Uh, and not speak to the very fact that I believe that they have been grossly deceived. And that's the issue that, that I have here, is uh, there needs to be some discernment on the part of the church. This man is going into churches and singing, and they don't know that he believes they're offering false worship. And I consider that quite hypocritical. And in turn, on that point, I even had mentioned to him, I said, are you actually sitting these, these so-called uh, Trinitarian churches that you're invited to sing at? I said, are you sitting down with the pastor beforehand? <laughs> yeah, really. Oh. Or, or are you at least prior to your singing, making it known, making it known to the congregation that uh, you find this position of trinitarianism utterly false, that you have received revelation, okay, as to this uh, newfound or this new, uh, this newfangled uh, uh, idea of God? Mm-hmm. Are you making that known before? You know, you're taking a moment to explain this to them. What do you say? Well, he didn't have an answer. No, that's because he's not doing it because he knows you wouldn't be singing. And getting his honorarium checked that night. Well, Mike, I really appreciate that. Uh, I will be very interested to see if Mr. Hempel, hey, if he'd like to be on the program, I'd be glad to defend the deity of Christ against a quote-unquote prophet because I know what the Word of God teaches. So uh, let's see if we can arrange it. Thanks a lot, Mike. All right, God bless. If you listen the next time, we'll see you on the dividing line. God bless.